What does your perfect world look like? An end to genocide, corn dogs for dinner every day, David Tennant at my house for board games, and Carl Sagan would be there too. He'd be immortal and not dead. We could cure cancer with puppies and vomit wouldn't exist. Unfortunately, sometimes we need to vomit to survive. David Tennant doesn't know I exist. And while scientists are experimenting with dogs that can diagnose cancer through scent, puppies are not helping to cure the disease. Gases likewise don't live in a perfect world either. It'd be great if their particles always fulfilled the assumptions of the ideal gas law and we could use PV equals NRT to get the right answer every time. But the ideal gas law, much like our culture, has really unrealistic expectations when it comes to size and attraction. Namely, it assumes that particles do not have size at all and that particles never attract each other. Well, I don't know about you, but it's hard for me to take up no space no matter how much I want to disappear. And attraction, so far, that's never gone away. So the ideal gas law often becomes little more than the ideal gas estimate when it comes to what gases do naturally. <laughs> You remember the ideal gas law? It's a combination of three related laws that were discovered by a variety of scientists. Let's review real quick. Boyle's law was first published by Robert Boyle in 1660, but it was actually discovered by two of his contemporaries, Richard Townley and Henry Power. It says that the product of the pressure and the volume of a gas is always constant as long as the temperature remains the same. Boyle's law requires a closed system where the amount of gas is constant like in my balloon. Next is Charles' Law, which was discovered by Jacques Charles and actually named for him, though it was first published by Joseph Louis Gay-Lussac, who wasn't a scoundrel. Yes, I'm looking at you, Robert Boyle. Charles' Law, which also requires a closed system, states that the volume of a gas divided by its temperature gives a constant as long as the pressure is held steady. <laughs> And then there's Avogadro's law discovered by resident house elf Amadeo Avogadro. And this one does not require a closed system. In fact, it's all about changing the amount of gas. Like, like I just did there. It says that the volume of a gas divided by the amount results in a constant as long as the temperature and pressure are held steady. The more gas you have at a given temperature and pressure, the more space it takes up, and vice versa. That's pretty intuitive, right? The trouble is that it's kind of inconvenient to use three different laws to figure out what one sample of gas is doing. So eventually, the three laws combined into one by surprise our old friend Dmitry Mendeleev. He pulled all the elements together into the periodic table, and it turns out he pulled all the gas laws together too. Smart guy. The main thing Mendeleev did was to calculate just one constant, R, also called the universal gas constant, which incorporates the various constants from all of the gas laws. With a little rearranging, we now have the ideal gas law that we know and love. R equals 8.3145 liter kilopascals per Kelvin mole. But don't let the crazy units scare you. It looks complicated, but it's really just a measurement label like meters or newtons, and it helps us out a lot in our calculations which is mostly what we'll be doing today. This is all pretty cool, but remember that it's called the ideal gas law for a reason. It only works perfectly when gases behave ideally, with the particles not taking up too much space and not being attracted to each other. It's a bit of an oppressive regime, but under normal conditions, most gases come close enough to ideal behavior that we get very little error. It only breaks down badly in conditions like high pressure or low temperature or high density that shove the particles so close together that they take up a large proportion of the available Space. This also causes any attraction between them to be magnified. Just like how I didn't think Alison Kane was that attractive until she became my lab partner and then she was right there next to me all the time and I couldn't handle it. Johan van der Waals came up with a way to correct the equation for real gas behavior and we're gonna explore that soon. But it's important that we know first how to use the base equation. And besides, it's close enough most of the time without the correction factors, so why make it harder than it needs to be? 
One last thing, remember that STP, or standard temperature and pressure, is zero degrees Celsius and 100 kilopascals. But gas law equations are done in kelvins, not degrees Celsius, so we'll call it 273.15 K and 100 kilopascals. STP is sort of a baseline level that we use so scientists everywhere can compare gas behaviors under the same conditions, and as we'll see, it's useful in calculations too. So, we got this fancy schmancy new law just lying around doing nothing. Let's figure out some stuff. I wonder how much space 1.00 mole of an ideal gas takes up at STP. That would be its volume, and we can calculate it like this. We know that PV equals nRT. We know that we want 1.00 mole. We know what R is. It's its constant. And since we're at STP, we know the temperature and pressure too. Plug in all the numbers, leaving the volume as a variable, since that's what we're trying to find out. By doing the math, I'm doing it in my imaginary calculator here, we find that the volume equals 22.71105675. And because of the big scary looking unit on R, the kilopascals, moles, and kelvins all cancel out, leaving us with liters, which is exactly what you'd expect for a volume unit. This confirms that the problem was set up correctly, so that's nice. Rounding our answer to the correct number of significant digits and adding the unit gives a final answer of 22.7 liters per 1.00 mole of gas. But wait, you cry, didn't we learn last time that 1.00 mole of any gas is a volume of 22.4 liters? Yes! I am astounded that you remembered that so well. In fact, 1.00 mole of a gas will take up slightly different amounts of space depending on what the pressure is. I said just now that it was at STP, which is a pressure of 100 kilopascals. The 22.4 liter number is for a gas at one atmosphere. While 100 kilopascals and one atmosphere are similar, they are not the same. In fact, one atmosphere is 101.325 kilopascals, and I assure you that if you did the calculation using 101.324 kilopascals of pressure, you'd get 22.4 liters. But you don't have to trust me, you can do the calculation yourself. So instead of doing that, which would be boring, Let's make things a little more interesting. Like bigger. You know, like super big. Like way bigger. Let's make it Hindenburg big. The Hindenburg was a Zeppelin, a flying machine that's held aloft by lighter than air gas, but unlike a hot air balloon or a blimp, has a rigid metal frame to support its shape. It was nearly as big as a cruise ship and many times larger than the Airbus A380, today's largest flying passenger vehicle. It was built in Germany in 1936 and made 10 trips to the US and seven to Brazil in its first year of service. The Hindenburg annoyed Hitler and the Nazis. For one thing, it was named for Paul von Hindenburg, the president of Germany before Hitler took over. Propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels tried to make them name it the Hitler, but they refused, thankfully. And second, the Hindenburg was fancy new technology that the Nazis wanted to use both militarily and as propaganda. The makers did not want that to happen. They did allow it to be used for one huge propaganda mission called the Die Deutschlandfahrt, or Tour of Germany, no giggling. But after that, it was used only for passenger and freight service. But none of that is the reason that we still talk about the Hindenburg today. Sadly, it's most famous for catching on fire and crashing while it was trying to land in Lakehurst, New Jersey on May 6th, 1937. That's bad enough under any circumstances, but it also happened to be filled with hydrogen gas, H2, which is highly flammable. The original plan was to fill it with non-flammable helium, but helium was extremely expensive at that time. And because hydrogen gas has a molar mass roughly half that of helium, it provides more lift too. So the Zeppelin company felt that using hydrogen was an acceptable risk, but the result was the loss of 36 lives. No one knows how the fire started, but it's clear that it ended in tragedy. So let's do some calculations to build our understanding of what the Hindenburg was all about. First, let's figure out how many moles of H2 were aboard the ship when it left Germany. We know that the hydrogen bags had a total volume of 211,890,000 liters, 
So we can start there. We don't know what the atmospheric pressure was that day, but we can assume that it was close to average atmospheric pressure, about 100 kilopascals, and the internal pressure would be about the same. So the volume is 2.1189 times 10 to the eighth liter, N is what we're trying to find out. R is always the same, 8.3145 liter kilopascals per Kelvin mole. And average early May temperatures in Germany range around 10 degrees Celsius, which is 283.15 Kelvin. With this information, we can now solve for the amount of hydrogen gas. Doing the math and rounding properly, we find that N equals 9.00 times 10 to the sixth. All the units cancel except for moles, which we add to the end. So the Hindenburg started out with 9.00 times 10 to the 6. That's 9 million moles of hydrogen gas. That is a lot. So how much extra could the Hindenburg carry because it was using hydrogen instead of helium? 9 million moles of H2 times its molar mass, 2.016 grams per mole, calculates to a little over 18,000 kilograms or 18 metric tons of gas. On the other hand, helium's molar mass is 4.003 grams per mole. So if they had used 9 million moles of that, the gas would have had a total molar mass of over 36,000 kilograms. So with hydrogen instead of helium, the Hindenburg can carry 18 metric tons more. Here's another interesting question. It's warmer in New Jersey than in Germany. On an average day in May, the outdoor temperature there would be around 18 degrees Celsius, or 291.15 Kelvin. If we assume that the volume and amount of gas in the Hindenburg were constant, how much did the internal pressure increase? We're looking for P, so we leave that as a variable. The volume and amount have to stay the same as before. R is always the same, and our new temperature is 291.15. Using those numbers, we find that the new pressure is 102. 2.822. Given the right number of significant digits and the right unit, the final answer becomes 103 kilopascals. So it looks like we've gotten pretty good at these calculations. Time for some fun. This is a fire piston. Like everything around us, it contains air, and it has a plunger that allows you to compress that air very quickly. The sudden but extreme increase in pressure will cause the temperature of the air inside to rise equally suddenly and extremely. Of course, hot air looks just like cool air, so that's kind of boring on its own, but if I put a small piece of cotton inside to provide fuel, watch closely, and boom! Did you see that? The inside of the piston got so hot that it actually ignited the cotton. Solid proof that increased pressure does indeed lead to increased temperature. Pretty cool. Thank you for watching Crash Course Chemistry. If you were paying attention, you learned that taking up space and attraction to others caused just about as much trouble for gases as they do for us. That Mendeleev came to the rescue once again by combining three separate gas laws into one simple equation and how to use said equation. You also learned a lot about the amazing Hindenburg at its tragic end. Why the stuff that makes party balloons cool might have made the Hindenburg a lot cooler too and how to make fire with cotton and your 